Okay, thank you very much uh, to the organizers and Vincent for inviting me. And um, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to talk to this audience. I really uh, did want to get this out to the brainstem audience. Um, so uh, this is a talk on INS stimulation, uh, infrared neural stimulation. Uh, I, and just to let you know, I'm now uh, at Vanderbilt University where most of this work was done and also at uh, Zhejiang University in Hangzhou, China. Okay, so um, I've been doing intrinsic signal op optical imaging through windows on the brain for quite a while. Uh, in fact, uh, at cocktail parties, I tell people I, I'm a window person. Uh, and uh, that's uh, something I've been doing for quite a while. Um, we use CCD cameras uh, over these implanted windows to detect uh, changes in hemodynamic signals related to neural activity. Uh, this is simply what fMRI people call the initial dip. So each, uh, each uh, CCD pixel will um, uh, record an, a deoxygenation event that causes a, a negative reflectance uh, signal change on the cortex. Um, through this window, we can uh, implant them in monkeys who are doing cer certain behaviors. Uh, we can do electrophysiological recordings and stimulation. Uh, the windows are MRI compatible, so we can do uh, MRI mapping, optogenetics, uh, infrared neural stimulation, and also anatomical tracer injections. Now, through these windows, uh, I've been imaging quite a long time, and so what I've learned is that the cortex, cerebral cortex, is modular. Of course, this has been known for a while. Uh, what we've uh, learned is that these modules are quite functionally specific, and they are arrayed in very specific manners, and, and there are signatures of different cortical areas, what the array patterns are like in V1, for example, V2, and V4. Um, importantly, uh, these cortical modules are quite small in size. They're about a couple hundred microns. And this is a, I've discovered, a fairly ubiquitous feature across cortical areas, uh, both sensory areas, motor areas, uh, prefrontal areas. And there's quite a lot of evidence accumulating now that um, this is an important uh, basic fundamental uh, architecture of the, of the cortex. Um, also, you should uh, note that within a single area of cortex, there are multiple uh, functional networks interdigitated amongst each other. So for example, this is a network, this monkey is looking at color, I can see that, that uh, I can tell you that just by looking at the image. This monkey is looking at oriented gratings, uh, and these uh, different functional uh, networks are, are really interspersed amongst each other in a very specific way. In V1 and V2, the patterns of uh, color and of orientation representation are quite different. And in addition, um, the connectivities between these cortical columns are also uh, uh, quite specific from area to area. But one commonality is that um, these uh, patches or columns are very similar in size, whether they be in V1, V2, V4, somatosensory cortex, or even motor, motor cortex. So this is something that is a common architectural feature that these columns uh, are 200 or 300 microns in size, and they're connected to each other in specific functional networks. So, oh, and finally, uh, we see these uh, uh, functional networks not only within single cortical areas, but also between cortical areas. That is, individual columns are connected to other individual columns in other areas in very uh, specific patterns. Um, and so, we would like to uh, be able to trace these connection patterns in vivo in the live animal without having to sacrifice the animal and without having to do histology and extensive anatomical reconstruction. I also would like to mention that these networks, these modular networks, are also involved in cognitive uh, behavioral and cognitive tasks. So for example, in area V4, um, after we've mapped these modules in area V4, we see that depending on the behavioral condition, spatial attention or feature attention, we see that these modules are networked together in very different fashions. So um, these modules, my point is these modules are, are there, they're networked, and they're very relevant for behavioral uh, uh, tasks. So what we want to do is really just to stimulate one of these modules and be able to trace out their connections with other nearby modules in the same area, as well as uh, modules in other areas. And so we want to develop a, a in vivo functional track tracing method that is focal, 
That is, we can stimulate a single column, ideally, um, and, and, and then reveal these networks. And, and the, there are two major purposes of this. One is functional track tracing, and the second is modulation of behavior, so that we can directly modulate, uh, we can directly relate um, the effect of, the behavioral effect of electrical stimulation with the underlying networks. Okay, I put this slide in just to remind people that um, you do lose information when you don't have high spatial resolution. So, for example, um, for a typical MRI voxel, three millimeter by three millimeter, you can see that within a single voxel, there are many, many cortical modules in this location. Now, th this location includes many different types of functional modules. So when you're doing an, uh, looking at an fMRI uh, response, a single voxel is an average of multiple functionalities. And when you look at connections between voxels, you're also looking at connections between the average of different functionalities. And so you need to remember that. Um, for, for, for me, my ideal is to be able to say specifically this column is connected to X other columns. And so that's, that's my goal. And even with a one millimeter voxel, you can see that there are multiple columns within that locale. Okay, so uh, infrared neural stimulation. This is a technique that was initially uh, used in the peripheral nervous system, developed by Duco and Nita Jansen at Vanderbilt. Um, they uh, used this on peripheral sciatic nerve and showed that there were motor, motor responses in, in the limb uh, following stimulation. It is a technique that applies a train of very brief pulses of the uh, infrared neural light. Uh, this particular one is at 1.875 microns, so it's very long wavelength light. And it, its mechanism is, is via uh, heat transient induction. So the heat transient causes a membrane protein conformation in the membranes, and then that leads to action potentials. Now, there are probably multiple um, <clears throat> mechanisms at play because the heat transient can induce um, probably other, other effects, such as uh, effects on, on vasculature, uh, effects on cytochrome oxidases in mitochondria, uh, as well as um, there are also people who have reported trip channel effects, uh, such that when you apply trip channel blockers, you can block this effect. So it's a combination of effects that this, this stimulation is, is um, uh, affecting. Okay, so <clears throat> the advantages of this method are that, number one, unlike electrical current stimulation, there is no current spread. If you apply the light with a 200 micron fiber, you will get a 200 micron spot. And so therefore, you can uh, feasibly activate a single cortical column. It's so, so therefore, it's very focal. Uh, you can achieve high spatial resolution con connectivity mapping. Um, and furthermore, if you want to do electrical recording during the stimulation, uh, you don't get electrical stimulation artifacts. So that's nice. Furthermore, uh, using light in the MR is very easy. So it's MRI compatible. Uh, this can be non-invasive, at least relatively non-invasive in our hands. You can simply apply it to the window that we've uh, uh, implanted. And, but you can also uh, insert these fiber optics deep into deep structures, uh, similar to the way you do DBS. And importantly, unlike optogenetics, it requires no viruses. And that makes it potentially uh, more applicable for human clinical use. Okay, so we started uh, this series of studies by um, characterizing the basics. Uh, so what we did was record electrophysiologically during uh, INS stimulation, and you can see that uh, typically it will uh, induce an excitatory response in neurons, uh, but there on occasion we do see inhibitory responses, and, and I believe that this has to do with the size of the fiber optic you use relative to the cortical column if you invade the uh, suppressive surround, you can get a, an inhibitory effect. Uh, so the important thing is that if you increase the radiant exposure of the light, uh, then you can get a, a larger response, and this is very proportional. You can see the radiant exposure to um, the reflectance change as measured with intrinsic uh, uh, optical imaging. 
And if you increase the rep rate, you can also get an increase um, reflectance response. So we can characterize the range within uh, which it is effective and its effect on neurons and the hemodynamic response. One big issue that um, NIH, invest <laughs> NIH funding agencies and other clinicians are very interested in is whether this method is safe. So um, Nick Chernoff and, and a, a, another student of mine did a number of studies uh, showing that uh, the histology following uh, INS stimulation within a range of parameters is very uh, safe um, uh, using nissel stains and cytochrome oxidase stains. The tissue looked very normal. We know the range within which it starts to induce lesions. Uh, following many sessions of electrophysiology and optical imaging, the responses are normal. We can do repeated stimulation, hundreds of trials within a single session. We can do uh, multiple sessions twice per week across months of time. Uh, and all of these measures appear to be normal. Um, the animal's behavior is normal. Health is normal. And so we believe that, at least for primates, this uh, technique seems to be quite safe and effective. OK, so let me just um, show you one example of using this laser stimulation in the fMRI. Uh, this picture here in A is a picture of a anesthetized squirrel monkey uh, with an implanted optical window or the somatosensory cortex. And you see around it a surface coil. And this, is, uh, this animal is being imaged in a, a 9.4T varying, uh, varying magnet. Now this, uh, oh wait, I can't see it. Here we are. Um, this optic fiber here is being directed at the location of a digit, I believe it's di digit D2 in this case, in area 1. We know where these areas are uh, because we've done optical imaging in this animal, and so we know where area 3A, 3B, and area 1 are, and where the digit location is. So once we've um, put the fiber at this location, uh, we take slices, both uh, transverse slices as well as coronal slices, and uh, map the brain during stimulation. This image here just shows you simply, uh, in response to tactile stimulation of the digit, we get three spots here, one each in area 1, area 3B, and area A in the topographically uh, correct locations. And then here, once we uh, stimulate with the fiber optic, uh, you can see a large activation here at the, at the tip of the fiber optic, and then here another activation, some voxels, voxels that are significantly active. Um, at the location of the corresponding digit location in area 3B. Now this is just a second case here, uh, a little higher magnification, showing this is a site of stimulation. And then you get these uh, small patches around that happen to be about 200 microns in size. So we were pretty excited about this, that uh, we might be able to see both um, intra-aerial uh, as well as inter-aerial connectivity patterns with the INS stimulation. Now, in the other plane, in the coronal plane, uh, you can see that uh, this is central sulcus here, and this is the site where the laser uh, fiber is coming in, a strong uh, uh, response at that location. But in addition, so this is in area 1, and then in addition, in area 3B and in area 3A, you see small uh, activation zones right here, and they happen to uh, be in the middle layers of the cortex consistent with, you know, a feed for um, uh, connectivity. So this suggests to us that um, these activations are actually via connections from the stimulated site. And if you lower the stimulation level, you do not get these activation zones. So um, this suggests to us that uh, there is a a feasibility for, for doing this type of functional track tracing in vivo in the fMRI. We wanted to sh uh, sh stimulate single functional domains. So here's an experiment where we tried uh, stimulating a single ocular dominance column, in this case the left eye ocular dominance column, and we showed that when you do this, you get an enhancement of the left eye columns and a relative suppression of the right eye columns, consistent with previously known electrophysiological effects. There's a push-pull between the right and left eye columns. So this shows that, yes, indeed, we can get functionally specific effects with this kind of stimulation. And finally, we wanted to see if we could get behavioral effects with this kind of stimulation. 
So this is an ex uh, example. We, we just did this as a test bed uh, of an awake monkey doing fixation task. And what we have done is mapped out the visual cortex here. We know the coordinates of visual topic representation in this location, in this region of the chamber. We put the uh, INS laser right here. And this is just showing that location and the stimulation uh, in here. And when we do that, what happens is you induce a phosphine. That is, uh, when you stimulate the cortex, monkey thinks there is a spot of light coming on in the visual world. And since we know exactly where we are stimulating on the cortex, we know where the eye should move. Whenever there's a spot, monkey will move its eyes toward that spot. And indeed, the monkey does this very reliably, goes towards that spot, and um, the, the motion is, is fast, uh, it's accurate, uh, and furthermore, it occurs at the, predict, at the expected latency. That is, when you, when you look at something, it takes about 300 milliseconds, so it has the predicted delay. Uh, and finally, uh, over multiple trials, it's extremely accurate, so these, these, the gray zones are the errors the, uh, of the trajectory, and you can see that um, over 37 trials, the trajectory is very reliable. And when you don't stimulate, the monkey does not perform in a saccade. So this uh, at least is a proof of principle study uh, showing that this kind of stimulation not only has um, effects on neurons, but can affect behavior as well. OK, so um, I'm going to stop here. Basically, I've uh, told you that the cortex is modular. There are networks of these modules. We want to trace these networks using INS stimulation. And this seems to be feasible uh, for relating not only in vivo uh, network, uh, networks, uh, uh, tracing out in vivo networks, but also in inducing predictable behavior. And we hope that uh, this can become a tool for clinical use uh, and perhaps for brain-machine interfaces. Okay, thank you very much.